Now you just get your phone out, you send me some abuse. It's quite simple. I even understand the, the mentality behind it. I think it's unhappiness. I think these are unhappy people, and they see me as someone who has a better life than they deserve. I just complain for a living, that's what I do. And that can be upsetting, you know. I, I, I even understand that. I, I had some dark years. You know, I'm glad Twitter wasn't around. I lived in Swindon for five years. <laughs> It's not a bad place, but I think when you're in your mid-twenties and you could live anywhere in the world for your job and you pick Swindon, it is a sign there's something wrong. <laughs> uh, I lived above some garages and uh, I would get drunk at night. And had Twitter been around, I think I would have been a troll. I think I would have seen people on telly and sent them abuse just because it's easier to make someone else feel bad than lift your own circumstances, isn't it? So random people, nice people, just like at Nick Knowles, just, are you going to build a house or host a quiz? Why don't you fucking pick one? <laughs> got off to bed, I told that bloody Nick Knowles. You delete him in the morning, you think, oh, he seems quite nice, and I just cried watching DIY SOS. That's what's happened there. I've lashed out. And he does seem lovely, doesn't he? I even stopped doing that joke for a while because I thought he seems nice, but then he brought an album out, so I brought it back. <laughs> I felt he was provoking me there, to be honest. <laughs> Nick Knowles has got an album out, if you're unaware, which begs the question, what is wrong with the world? And more specifically, what is wrong with Nick Knowles? Why has nobody close to him just taken him aside and said, I know you like singing, Nick, but don't do that. <laughs> it's no one else's fault. We all sing in the shower. If you want, get your shed converted, turn it into a studio. You know, you've got contacts. I'm sure you could do it for now in a weekend if you wanted to, but... <laughs> don't release an album, mate. I, I honestly think he's gone mad. I think you watch DIY SOS. It's powerful telling, isn't it? I always cry watching it and you think... I realise for Nick Knowles, he's spent the last 10 years around people in tears telling him what a good guy he is. He's just gone insane. He just thinks he's single-handedly keeping the country together here. <laughs> single-handedly reversing Tory Cots, Nick Knowles, and he's seen the music news over the last couple of years. He's thought, well, Prince has gone, Bowie's gone. <laughs> Knowles, he's gonna have to get his guitar out here, I think. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do for the music industry what I did for that three-bed semi in Romford. <laughs> Make it relevant for the people again. I don't understand the logic behind it. But, you know, these men, they send me the abuse, and I don't mind. And it's that thing is, I think they just think my life is better than it is. I think they see me and they think, right, I'll bring him down a peg. They think, I'll do a gig like tonight. I'll come straight off the back of the stage and there'll be a limousine waiting for me there. And that'll whisk me straight off to the Blackpool Ritz. Um, <laughs> you probably don't know about the Blackpool Ritz. Um, <laughs> and they wouldn't let your sort in, to be honest. It's, it's not really for you. It's, uh, it's underneath Marks and Spencers. You go... Um, <laughs> You go underneath there and uh, you've got like a big marble top bar like that. It's only famous people in there. I'll go in there. Ed Sheeran will be there. He's just done Blackpool Arena. Um, <laughs> go up to Ed. I go, hi, Ed, you don't know me, but I'm also famous. I go, oh, bloody hell, of course I know you, mate. How are you doing? <laughs> that's Ed Sheeran. If you haven't heard him talk, that's... That's me, Ed Sheeran impression there. I do about three impressions throughout the gig. I've learned from doing it. It's just easier for you if I tell you who it is first. <laughs> Don't want to leave you hanging, I'll just tell you and then I'll do it. I'll throw a physical clue in if I can, like the guitar. He's always writing into your head. What are you up to? I'm writing a song about these peanuts. <laughs> just put the guitar down and enjoy your life, Edward, please. Everything's going fine. I don't know if you've heard the albums. They're on everything. They really are. Every radio station and advert. Sometimes they're on the breeze. That can be on Headland, miles from anywhere. I just hear, I'm in love with your body. <laughs> He's on the wind. <laughs> just relax. What do you want to drink, mate? He said, I'll have a porn star martini. I say, barman, three porn star martinis. Just tip the third one on the floor, cos some people are poor. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ed and I will just drink and talk about all the other celebrities we know. I don't know if you know the celebrities we only hang around with each other, cos then we've got that to talk about, you know. What could you tell us of life? So Ed will say to me, what are you doing this summer then, John? I say, well, I'm actually going on a canal boating holiday with Diane Abbott and Peter Crouch. You wouldn't think we'd get on, would you? But, you know, it's a cracking triumvirate, it really is. We have a right laugh. You know, Crouchy's not cut out for barge living, obviously, but... <laughs> he makes an effort for Diane. She fires him up politically. He comes away so alive and, you know... In return, he's making her quite a deadly six-yard striker, he really is, so... <laughs> it's tit for tat, really, and we'll have a laugh. Eventually, Ed gets drunk and just wanders off like that. I say, where are you going to, mate? He's like, I've got to talk to girls and see if they're from somewhere I'm going to do a song about them. OK, don't do Galway, mate. You've already done that one. I go, yeah, cheers, mate. She was from Cleveland's. <laughs> look forward to hearing line two. 
It's regrettable. So, that, you know, I, I, I did have you, you were wondering, with all this, you know, reluctance to be happy, how did you end up uh, becoming happy? And it's because I had a turning point. I had a, a significant moment in my life. Something happened which uh, changed the course of my life, right? And it happened after the wedding of the friend who stagged who I'd been on, right? We went back to America. Uh, America is a country, of course, which prides itself on individuals being able to do whatever they want to do, which is not something I am comfortable with, if I'm honest. You can do whatever you like in America and what I like to do instead is think of things I'd like to do, imagine them ending with me getting hurt and stay inside and sitting down. Right. So we go out for my friend's wedding and after the wedding what happens is we go to a cabin in the wilderness, right, and we decide we're gonna, we're gonna drink and play cards and get to know each other again, right, and uh, when we get to the cabin there's a slight problem initially which is there's something in the cabin which I hadn't encountered before which is insects. Right, now, I say that because you think, well, we've got insects. We haven't got insects. We've got midges and flies. We've got flying toys, is what we've got. <laughs> in America, they've got things called hornets and a thing called a cockroach. Now, if you've never seen a cockroach before, they're about the size of a Labrador. <laughs> if you imagine that Labrador is driving something like a Fiat Seicento, that would give you an idea of the build of the thing right now. With most insects, I'll be honest, what I do is I uh, scream and I run away from them. That's, that's my first policy. But obviously you can't do that if they're in your house. You have to deal with them a different way. And policy number two is to stand on them. Uh, I'm not proud of that, but let's be honest, there's billions of them. So I'll just... Eh! Right now. The problem with a cockroach, you stand on a cockroach and absolutely nothing changes. They just carry on about their business. <laughs> dragging you along with them. If you could get on two, you could ride them into town like that. <laughs> Built like tanks they are, right? So I have to elevate to option number three, right? And option number three is to drink until I can't feel them crawling all over my flesh anymore. Because <laughs> obviously, as we all know, that cockroaches crawl in your mouth while you're asleep, they lay eggs in your stomach and you die. <laughs> so what I do is I drink an awful lot of whiskey, right? And by the end of the evening, as the smallest one in the group, I'm now what you would call royally shit-faced. <laughs> go up to bed, pop a little plastic bag over my head so they can't get me while I'm asleep. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. <laughs> anyway, I, drink, I drink a lot of whiskey, right? I go to bed, come down in the morning, I'm feeling very sick, right? And uh, my only hope is that all my friends feel as sick as I do, and that's the end of today, isn't it? They say, what do you want to do today? I say, I really want to sit still and not say anything, and then sporadically look out of a window, think of some toast and be sick. <laughs> I get down there, they're all fine, because they're bigger than me and they're not scared of anything like insects, so they're planning the day out. And my mate goes, hey, John, there's a lake down the road. We're going to go and see if we can hire a speedboat. Oh. <laughs> I just can't tell you the many ways in which that's not what I wanted to do with my day, right? When he said that, I heard it in the voice of Michael Burke, because uh, I grew up watching a programme called 999 with Michael Burke. <laughs> We all started with things like that. If you haven't seen the programme, what it was is people nearly died, and instead of chalking that up to experience, we used to reconstruct it with actors for fun. <laughs> and we'd have Michael Burke's sobering commentary so you could really enjoy it, right? Because, let's be honest, they might as well have called that programme Sometimes Dickheads Get What's Coming To It. <laughs> Uniquely moronic people on that programme. You have Michael Burke saying, Steve was a diabetic who hadn't eaten for three months when he decided to swim the English Channel. <laughs> this is going to be a fun one. Everyone gather round. <laughs> Bring those crisps I bought back from the holiday. And then they spiral out, so someone calls the Coast Guard because he's drowning, but the Coast Guard's pawned his arms to buy drugs and nobody knew, so... <laughs> he sets off in the boat but can't steer, so he runs straight over Steve, knocking him out, and tangling his ponytail in the propeller, and they drag each other to the coast of France. Where they're shouting, please help, we don't know what to do, which is the French for fucking bring it if you think you're hard enough. <laughs> oh, war with a village, right? So when he said that, I heard Michael Burke saying, the four alcoholics decided to hire a vehicle they'd never driven before in a country they didn't know. Uh, we're going to die today. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> we're going to die on a boat today, or off a boat. That's the great thing about boats, you can die on or off them. <laughs> I'm really going to have to stop this happening, right? And uh, it was too early then, so they bundled me into the back of the van. I'm secretly content that you can't just get speedboats, can you? Because they're too big, do you know what I mean? Like in this country, if you went to the Lake District, say, excuse me, can I have a speedboat? They'd say, ah, have you got a speedboat and your speedboat licence? In America, it's slightly different, you see. In America, you drive down to a lake and you'll find a shack by that lake and you walk into the shack and behind the desk will be a toothless local. 
And you approach the local and you say, excuse me, we're not from around here. Can we have a speedboat? And he will reply, sure as shit you can have a speedboat. <laughs> this is America, son. Go out on a speedboat. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> That is a hauntingly accurate recollection <laughs> of exactly what happened. Five minutes before, I was vomiting at the thought of toast. Now, I'm about to be given the keys to a fucking speedboat. <laughs> All he said was, he said, you can have a speedboat so long as one of y'all got a driving license. And my friend went, yeah, I've got a driving license. I said, yeah, he's got a driving license for a different vehicle in a different land. <laughs> I'm still not sure what relevance a UK driving license is to a speedboat in America. If I'm honest, you can't go to Australia and say, excuse me, can I have that hot air balloon? Of course you can, mate. Can I just ask, have you ever been on Dodgems? <laughs> Moronic country, right? So he's drawing it through, and I think I've got my first chance here to save everybody's life. They'll not thank me for it at the time, but I'm not going to die today, right? So I said, uh, oh, I don't suppose you've brought your paper counterpart, though, have you? <laughs> oh! I won't be able to go, mate. That's just only half a license he's giving you there. You should have... You're not even listening. Right? This is the license as far as I'm concerned. Pink motherfucker. Ain't never seen one of those before. <laughs> Let's go get the keys to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Off he goes to get the keys. We conger off behind him, right? As we're going across the shop, my friend notices a fridge which is full of beers. And he says, excuse me, are we allowed to buy these beers? And he said, sure as shit you can buy those beers. <laughs> this is America, son. Get shit face. Go out on a speed boat. <laughs> His roof's in tatters. <laughs> We're now walking down to the lakeside with a crate of lagers under each arm and the keys to a speedboat, right? And I think, well, we're definitely going to die today. That's, that's a given now. At least the alcohol will numb the pain of death. Right? We get down to the, to the side of the lake for what I'm hoping will be a 30-minute to one-hour tutorial on how to drive a speedboat. <laughs> Various do's and don'ts of modern speedboatery. He chucks the keys in the boat. He goes, have a good day. Don't hit any other boats. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really the sort of sentence that if you have to say to someone, you shouldn't really be giving them the keys to a speedboat, I think. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they know not to drive directly into another speedboat. <laughs> so now I'm convinced this is going to be the last day of my life, right? And we get in the speedboat. And sure enough, after four to five hours, I'd had one of the best days of my entire life. <laughs> yeah. It's an awkward moment, that, isn't it? And all I would say is, if you feel let down by the end of that story, imagine how pissed off I was. <laughs> I went out there in good faith to die in a horrific accident that day, and I had to climb off my little high horse and admit I had a lovely day and thank them for inviting yeah. me. The first... And the worst thing they teach me as a man is that I'm supposed to be like a prince. I'm supposed to rescue women from all situations and do all things for them. And women don't need that anymore. They don't give a shit. And it's not... This sounds like I'm being... Oh, do you know what my problem is? I love too much. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'll ruin your fucking life. <laughs> I will follow you everywhere and do everything and weird little shitty things where you go, oh, I've got to book that. <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> I went through your diary. I saw you had that meeting coming up, so I booked the train for you. No need to thank me. <laughs> do, uh... <laughs> don't get angry with me, can you? Because it's a nice thing, but it's all festering away. <laughs> Until one day it all comes out and you just go, Will you piss off? I can eat a yoghurt on my own. And I go, you don't have to, I'll flick it at you. <laughs> you just tell me what yoghurt you like, I'll wake you up by flicking it into your face. So I tell you. <laughs> I'm going to have my own phone. <laughs> Fuck. That's not the voice I'm sticking with. I think that's the one that jars most with the body I've been given. Hey, hi, what's happening? You're leaving. <laughs> What's happening? I, I, the reason I want a relationship to work is because I finally, for the first time in my life, started to think I want kids. And I've never really... Broody, to me, is just not certain that I definitely don't want children. <laughs> if I, even for a second, think, oh, I could handle that, that is massive broodiness to me. <laughs> and it happened the other day, walking near where I live, I saw a woman pushing a pram with two kids in it, about toddler age, they could converse and understand. And all I had to say, really tedious comment, she just went, well, no, because cars aren't allowed to turn right all the time. Sometimes they have to go straight on. <laughs> that's all I heard her say. And I thought, that's what I want. I want to have to explain that to a human. Imagine how fun it must be to have company of two humans to whom you say a sentence like that, and they go, you blow my mind. <laughs> I've always thought they could just turn right willy-nilly, but you're telling me 
sometimes they have to go straight on. I mean, how do they, where do they end up? Well, they just do two rights. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> so glad you're with me. I just think I understand this world. And then, because I, I want to be a teacher. I just, I don't know where the lines are with children because I'm not naturally a, a sympathetic person. I like to be able to do things to help people, but they have to be concrete things. I'm not cuddly. I don't do, oh, <laughs> all that shit I hate. Words like didums and nunu and schminky and all that crap. When you tell someone a problem, they go, oh, did you boo You go, piss off, don't touch me. <laughs> tell me how to pay my rent this month. Don't tickle me like I'm a dog that's pissed on something. I'm not, and I, I, I don't think I could be, because I don't think sympathy is good, even for children. It's not good to be given sympathy. You need help. Like, you know, when you watch a child running around and then it falls over, there's a 30 second window. They don't cry straight away, there's a gap in which the whole world stops. And it's just the child working out what's happening. They're just going, well. That's a lot of carpet in the old face. <laughs> What's happened here? What was I doing? I was watching Thomas. I wanted a Jaffa cake. I really wanted a fucking Jaffa cake. <laughs> I run into the kitchen and I've got all this carpet up in my grill. And I think if you leave them there, they'll work that out. They'll become functioning human beings. But parents don't let them. As a parent, you see your child and you go, Oh, oh no! And that's when the kid goes, Shit, I'm dying. <laughs> Broken bones, I'll never walk again. <laughs> the least I can do is cry, I guess. I'll cry, then I'll get some ice cream, and then we'll deal with it later. <laughs> I reckon as a parent, if you see your child fall over and you go, <laughs> <laughs> the kid will go, what am I like? <laughs> oh, so sorry about that. I'm sorry. How many times have you told me about running? Ah, oh, full to myself. I'm going to go and watch some Thomas and chill out for a bit. <laughs> I'm not naturally sympathetic, and I'm not... I don't know when you're supposed to tell a child it's shit at something, and when you're supposed to accept that it's just a child that's not capable of this yet. I don't know. I, I just... I couldn't... Oh, what are you doing there? A little bit of colouring in? Oh. I just, well, no, I just... Well, I just wonder why you're carrying on with that, because you've gone out of the lines, haven't you? It's ruined. <laughs> you can never be perfect now, can it? Because you're going to have to start again, because I tell you what, it's not going on the fridge like that. <laughs> Trying to eat my breakfast with that brown line coming out of the tree. Bullshit, start again. <laughs> and here's a little tip from Daddy. When you do the next one, just have a look what colour your Winnie the Pooh is and then wonder why you've done him fucking purple. <laughs> it's not creativity, it's copyright infringement. <laughs> it's a registered trademark. That's why it talks and all that shit. Don't talk in real life. No, it would eat your face off. Put your face off to it. You could scream for help from Piglet, of course you could, but I imagine he had him first. <laughs> so fucking vulnerable. Anyway, what are you crying for? Get your shoes on, we're going shopping. <laughs> now we're getting onions. You need to learn to say this shit. <laughs> Otherwise you'll get bullied, cos I'll do it. I, do, I really don't, because I, I, I went to visit a friend who'd had kids. I've got a lot of friends who are starting to have kids because they've got mortgages. Uh, I start to worry they're going to leave each other, so I think we'll have a kid. That's us tied down for 18 years then. <laughs> they don't acknowledge that, obviously. They put some gloss on it and they stop inviting me around for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but they're starting to have kids, and I, I visited a friend who'd had a child, and the morning was just unbelievable. We went to an allotment, and it was looking at everything and laughing. It'd laugh at any old shit. Old jokes, nicked stuff. Idiot, this thing. You just pull a face, it would piss its pants. I was like, ah, oh, I definitely want a kid. I definitely want a kid. Then we went back to their house, and they gave it a banana. Total 180 degree U-turn, instantly. <laughs> this thing could not do banana. It was the most unpleasant, rancid thing I've ever seen. Didn't stop him shoving it in its face, though, did it? And the eyes on this kid went big. It knew what was happening, it was embarrassed for itself. It was just exactly the same eyes that a dog does when you watch it having a shit. Just like... <laughs> watch if you like, mate, but we're not gonna enjoy this, either of us. <laughs> Ramming this banana in it, and it could mush it up, of course it could. It could take the banana, mush it up. None of it was going down, just all, Ugh. <laughs> All spitty and brown now it was, going down its face, and I was looking at it going, Ugh. Oh, you sickened me. You can't have kids if that's your response, can you? My kids would be paranoid by about six, just rocking in a corner going, I'm not eating fruit, Daddy, I'm not. <laughs> you mush him, and then the parents will go, oh, get it back in, you go, oh! <laughs> God, it's on you now! Oh, now I can't touch anything in this spitty banana house of shit. <laughs> it's 
started imagining it cascading down the walls. It was like The Shining, I was trying to get out and it was oceans of it pouring down the stairs, trying to open the door without touching it and getting spitty banana all over me. 